Hello and welcome to News Click. Today is the 72nd anniversary of the horrific nuclear bombing in Hiroshima in 1945. To discuss more about this and uh, the threat to the world in terms of nuclear weapons, we have Prabir Purkaista, founding editor of News Click, and D. Ragunandhan, who is from the Daily Science Forum. Uh, Prabir and Raghu, welcome to News Click. How do you see the present world in the context of growing number of nuclear weapons? I think the scenario as far as nuclear weapons are concerned has actually worsened considerably. Uh, back from the days when we used to talk about the development of the neutron bomb and the new threats nuclear weapons were posing at that particular point of time. So from 80s, the seed has actually started worsening now. Uh, there was an interregnum where the nuclear stalemate had been recognized, there were steps to disarm, there were the SALT negotiations, the START uh, negotiations and treaties. There was a stepping back from the brink as it were at that point of time. Today, things have actually become much worse. We have new nuclear weapon states, India, Pakistan, Israel, uh, North Korea. We have this recognition that New, the United States and Russia seem to be preparing at least a scenario of a nuclear weapons exchange. And this, we could go to the history of this later, this certainly has brought the nuclear weapon threat much closer. In fact, recently Chomsky has a long sp uh, speech on this where he says that we have now come to the brink of extinction and humanity will have to decide very quickly which path it wants to tread for extinction or for survival of humanity. And at the moment, an accidental uh, weapon exchange, uh, if you're on the brink, any small thing can trigger a holocaust. And I think that's the kind of scenario we're facing. Let's not forget, in that whole period, what is called the Cold War, the, there had, they were on hair trigger alert for a long period and a number of exchanges were very narrowly averted. Some of them as malfunctioning of equipment, some of them as alarms which had been falsely raised. All of this is something that can trigger a holocaust, a complete extinction of humanity, not a genocide, complete ethnocide as it were. So I think this is a very, very dangerous moment. And on 6th of August today, when you remember Hiroshima, it's important for us to bring back the peace movement, the nuclear disarmament, disarmament movement because all of that sort of went away after the fall of Soviet Union and this was thought that this is the end of that kind of nuclear hair trigger which the world was on. This has not really happened. Well, if you ask me, besides what uh, Prabir has just said, uh, ever since uh, we saw a large number of countries going nuclear, some overtly and openly, and some uh, with a bomb under the bed, uh, if you like. Uh, there were attempts at uh, apparently trying to contain the spread of nuclear weapons and of rolling back the stockpiles of nuclear weapons which the leading nuclear powers were uh, holding. None of that has actually happened uh, today. The architecture evolved globally to try and contain the spread of nuclear weapons, which revolved around the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, has completely failed uh, in checking the spread of nuclear weapons either to more countries or the depth of uh, nuclear weapons held by specific nuclear weapons uh, nations. Neither of them has been uh, checked. There, there was a recent conference of the, uh, of the uh, countries of the world uh, who are part of the uh, NPT. And once again, the issue was raised there about Article 7, which calls for complete denuclearization, uh, nuclear disarmament in the world. The one aspect of the NPT which has been completely ignored since its inception, precisely because the leading nuclear power, the United States, has refused to denuclearize and in fact has also refused to 
declare a no first strike uh, policy, which means even today the United States retains its right to use nuclear weapons against not only other nuclear weapon states, but against anybody. Uh, and if the United States does not take any measures to step forward to even attempt uh, or commit itself to a pathway to denuclearization, there is no way in which any other country is going to do. So as I was saying, I think the world is certainly a more dangerous place today, or at least has not been a less dangerous uh, place. And I think we will have uh, a chance in future uh, discussions today to see how, in a sense, the dangers of proliferation uh, across countries and the danger of proliferation by countries of types of weapons, uh, etc., has actually intensified. Uh, Raghu, to talk more about non-proliferation treaty, do you think that uh, the non-proliferation treaty still holds the key to universal disarmament? It never did and it never will because it is uh, fundamentally flawed as a structure because the NPT says that the permanent five powers are allowed nuclear weapons but nobody else is allowed. The whole point of nuclear weapons in the world is if one power has it, it is an obvious inducement uh, to others to also have uh, nuclear weapons if for no other reason than self-preservation. If I know that you have a weapon with which you can hit me, obviously I will want something with which I can defend myself uh, against the strike and that builds in an incentive uh, to me. The P5 led by the United States in this case, claimed that we are good people, we have got nuclear weapons, but we will not use them. But all our experience has shown that this cannot be trusted. Uh, the United States still today remains the only country which has actually used a weapon, continues to proclaim that it retains the right to use uh, nuclear weapons. And if you see in the recent past, some countries which had acquired nuclear weapons capabilities, Libya, for example, gave up its nuclear weapons. It didn't have uh, nuclear weapons. It was, it trying, was trying to get to, some yeah. capability. So they were, it gave up the efforts, accepting the assurances that uh, you would be safe from uh, attack. Iraq under Saddam Hussein was also, the US claimed, had weapons of mass destruction, which turned out later not to be the case. But in any case, the, both these countries, which sought a nuclear weapons capability in order to defend themselves, saw themselves attacked by the US-led uh, forces, their leaderships killed and destroyed. After uh, giving up their nuclear weapons After giving weapons up programs. their nuclear weapons. weapons so programs. today, when the United States under Donald Trump wants to negotiate with North Korea and asks North Korea to denuclearize from the North, why will the North do it? When it has seen what has happened in Iraq uh, and Libya, and it knows what's on the cards if it uh, denuclearizes. There is no incentive for them uh, to do so. Currently, there is no incentive for India and Pakistan to do so uh, either. And Israel has never made a secret of the fact that although it has nuclear weapons, it has no intention to giving them up because that is the sole currency that it has for dominance of the uh, region. So given this logic that possession of nuclear weapons brings you power on the international stage. It's an obvious incentive for everybody else to pursue it. Iran had acquired some capabilities, but entered into an agreement with the United States and Europe to tone down that capability uh, that it has. And today finds the United States 
turning around and reopening uh, the discussion, which must be making the Iranians wonder why they agreed to the attempts that they did in the first place. So I don't see that the current structure paves the way for any attempts at denuclearization or nuclear disarmament. NPT certainly has not helped. I think either the NPT's Article 7 should become the guiding uh, clause of the NPT and compel universal nuclear disarmament or we should be thinking of a completely new architecture for global nuclear disarmament. Quick response also to the question is that disarmament was never put as a time-bound program. That's right. It was supposed to be in the Article 7. It was supposed to be something which would be good, would be done as good faith negotiations. The good faith negotiations took for a very brief period and stopped again after that, particularly with various steps the United States took, which I'm not going to get into right now. But this is one central issue that, that happened. And we must also see it in the context that Raghu talked about, not only regime change in Iraq and Libya, but also the United States is a sole country. I wouldn't say the sole country, but certainly one country which has invaded a number of other countries or had regime change operations, and none of it sanctioned by the United Nations, bar you can talk about Afghanistan being the only one where there was some semblance of even negotiations. All of them were unilateral ones. We can start from uh, the, their backyards uh, in, in Latin America to various places. So given the American record of invading other countries and having nuclear weapons, who talked, this issue of blackmail, that the fact is not only that they can bomb countries, using weapons of mass destruction, but in a preemptive strike. So this is, it's not just a preventive strike, but a preemptive strike. So these things, essentially this postulates, make then uh, defense against weapons, the other weapons also issue on the cards, because honestly, the conventional weapon strength of the United States is so huge that for countries to resist, using conventional weapons becomes difficult. Therefore, North Korea's argument was nuclear weapons and missiles is a low-cost trajectory, trajectory for us to fight what could be an invasion by the United States. I think that's also the reason today, the attraction, particularly after Gaddafi's uh, regime change and as killing, I think has become also an issue on which the nuclear non-proliferation treaty virtually has lost all significance. Uh, probably talking about the uh, blackmail we have seen in recent times, especially after Donald Trump has come to power, about uh, the rhetoric of my nuclear button is big. Uh, bigger than yours. Bigger than yours. Much bigger. <laughs> so, uh, in this context, we also see that there is an escalation of relationship between United States and Russia, where Russian, uh, the US rhetoric uh, of threat and rhetoric is quite increasing. And we also see that Russia has recently acquired a smart weapon. Uh, do you see uh, the, there is an increasing uh, nuclear race which is happening? Well, the US media has tried to project it as suddenly Russia unleashing a nuclear race. Uh, there is a set of new weapons Russia has talked about. Some of them, it seems, are fairly advanced in terms of what it can do. It also said very clearly that they are doing it because America refuses to talk to them, United States refuses to talk to them, and has ringed them around with the ABM shields. Now, ABM treaty was designed essentially to do what is called a, the, a certain kind of parity between nuclear weapon states. The assumption being, if both sides are able to destroy each other, they will not use nuclear weapons. And in order to that race, nuclear weapons race to be frozen, they did not want anti-ballistic shields to be deployed because then the one conventional way of overwhelming such shields is to increase the number of weapons. So this would have been an astronomic increase in nuclear weapons as more and more shields are deployed. So this is the reason why the ABM treaty, anti-ballistic missile treaty, was seen as a 
measure which would actually bring a kind of nuclear freeze and if necessary even a nuclear disarmament because it assures mutual assured destruction which otherwise seems to be a very contrary logic for any peace uh, to happen. This was the logic. Now United States when it withdrew in 2001 from the ABM treaty that itself sounded a warning that this whole argument of a nuclear parity uh, would, would actually disappear and this could lead to renewed arms race. It would not have happened even then if two things had continued. One, the continuation of the start, uh, continuation of the start talks, which is how to bring down the number of weapons, that essentially gets frozen. Deployment of ABM shields then start happening in Poland, Baltic. Now they are supposed to be initially the talk was against Iran. It doesn't make any sense. They're being all done on the borders of Russia, and Russia immediately are repeatedly asked, "Who are you deploying it against?" There is really no answer. There are also now uh, nuclear weapons, which are are there in Europe, which can be delivered in any place at least near Moscow in a matter of three to four minutes. So given the shortening of strike times and the fact you're putting a ballistic missile shield around Russia, Russia's conventional reply would be then to scale up its weapon strength. What they have done is not the numbers, but they're the kind of weapons, hypersonic uh, weapons, uh, things which can go in a zigzag way close to the ground and increasing the range of such weapons, uh, again uh, submarine based weapons which can do go really travel much further. So they, they have really used what I would call conventional increase in strength of, the, of how the delivery systems can operate which can defeat the ABM shield and Putin was very clear. He said we have these weapons but what we want is America, United States to recognize that this is an unwinnable war and come and negotiate on nuclear disarmament or at least scaling down the weapons. And that's something that the United States has refused to do. I think that is the reason why this quote-unquote nuclear race has started. And it is an unfortunate fact that the US media on this is so loyal, shall we say, to the larger geostrategic interests of the United States that it does not recognize that this con constitutes a threat to humanity. It's not a question of Russia and the United States. It's really a question of humanity that the whole globe is at stake. Not Mother Earth, but all human beings on Mother Earth is really facing extinction. This is something that they don't seem to recognize. And that is why it's important to bring back this issue on the Hiroshima Day, 6th of August. It's important to bring back that the doomsday clock, which had been pushed back a little because of all the nuclear disarmament measures which Russia and the United States has done, that is now being, has been advanced. And we are much closer to new, 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 nuclear Armageddon than we have ever been in the past, except for a brief period in the Cold War, during the Cold War. I think that's a threat we all now carry. Uh, thank you, Prabir, and thank you, Raghu, for speaking to NewsClick. Uh, thank you for watching NewsClick. Please log in to our website www.newsclick.in.